Hello, today I have the pleasure of um, speaking with Daniel Crooks. Uh, Daniel is a really significant contemporary artist working predominantly in video, photography and sculpture. He's widely known for works that capture and alter time, motion and which manipulate digital imagery as though it were a physical material. His work is held in numerous public and private collections. He's exhibited prolifically in Australia and abroad. Most recently, his work was included in the 2021 Tarawara Biennial and in the 2021 Asia Society Triennial in New York. This year, with the support of the Balnaves Foundation, the National Gallery has commissioned a new work, Structured Light, to be shown as part of the Enlightened Festival. It's a vast work projected onto the gallery's western facade, and it's one that also coincides with the 40th anniversary of the original National Gallery building designed by Cole Madigan. It alternately celebrates, challenges, and extends Madigan's renowned brutalist building and the philosophies that underpin it. So Daniel, at this point, you're probably intimately familiar with the building. Can you step us through the origins of your work and the things that struck you um, on your first site visit to the gallery? Yeah, I came up to Canberra for a site visit and I was just sort of wandering around, I suppose, you know, looking at the building, looking for different angles, trying to get a bit of a sense of it. And then I was actually wandering around under the pedestrian bridge and discovered kind of it felt quite sort of forgotten and a little bit neglected possibly <laughs> uh, it was the commemorative plaque for the master site set out and it's a an old brass circular plaque and it yeah it's really beautiful it really and it really kind of struck me I mean the first thing that actually struck me about it was one that it's sitting on this kind of beautiful octahedron and my first thought was that it's the pioneer plaque or the golden records it just had that whole aesthetic going on and of course then I'm looking at the date and it was opened by Gough Whitlam and it's you know 73 and of course the pioneer plaques or pioneer plaques went into space I think 72 early and late 72 respectively so it's you know totally kind of of that era mm. and also has a bit of sort of I don't know Swiss design about it as well and you know it had like a bird shit on it <laughs> <laughs> I was like wait a second what is happening here but yeah it really it was like oh this is this is gorgeous this is beautiful mm. and it absolutely sets out pretty boldly at that point Madigan's, you know, obsession with the equilateral triangle. Mm. Like it's, it's stated pretty clearly the height to base ratio and then everything is measured in this triangular grids coming out from that, that set out point. Yeah, that really just stuck with me, I suppose. And then, you know, coming back to the building, it's like, ah, oh, of course, yes, triangles, triangles, triangles. It's like, oh my God, the triangles there, the triangles everywhere. And yeah, I, I mean, that was, I guess, the sort of starting point and went, went home, went back to Melbourne, back in the studio, and then sort of, you know, I was, you know, I did a little bit of research on Madigan, and then I was sort of looking into the Pioneer. Yeah, went down some great rabbit holes. And just like um, for maybe the younger members of our audience, um, can you just speak to like those yes, Pioneer plants yes, a little okay. bit? So the Pioneer program was, set up by NASA and it was the first, it was literally the first objects that were, were gonna leave our solar system, mm. they were designed to leave our solar system. So they thought maybe what they'd do is put a little business card on the outside of the spaceship for any, you know, aliens who would happen to come across the plaque. And so <laughs> it's a kind of a crazy task. You're trying to make a business card for the whole of humanity to send into space and they tasked it to Carl Sagan and another astrophysicist whose name I can't now remember. Mm. And it was actually Carl Sagan's wife who did the illustration. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. So they tried to make this universal language that would be able to talk to anyone mm. and try and convey what, what Earth was, what hum, hum, who humans were, how culture worked, mm. and trying to sum it up on this little tiny business card and a handful of illustrations. Mm. And I mean, I challenge anyone who's not an astrophysicist to make kind of heads or tails of it. You know, it's all about these sort of elemental, fundamental givens of the universe that mm. theoretically we, everyone would understand that, you know, that helium 
is the smallest element we have and then the wavelengths of those and use that to measure things and then the pulsars that then point to where Earth is. Okay, so maybe not so universal, really. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a crazy thing. It's like, but it's great because there are a few people um, who, you know, there's been quite a lot of actual discussion and interrogation of what it actually meant and, you know, how that sort of plays out now and how we look at it now. Mm. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff just even about the way that the humans are portrayed on it, the fact that... Mm. You know, the guy has his arm sort of held up and the idea is that it, you know, it's showing kind of the opposed hmm. thumb and the opposed digits. But, you know, it's like, well, what? Would, would aliens just assume that people always you know, had an arm sticking out like this? Or, hmm. I mean, there's no reference to what way hmm. is up or down or even, I mean, this line drawing as a, as a construct. It's just kind of like, well, hmm. there's a lot of basic <laughs> stuff there that's some pretty big assumptions. Yeah. Okay, so from from that point and that kind of correlation temporally between the announcement of the construction of the National Gallery building, yep. the kind of synchronicity between the line drawings that you saw on the plaque and the pioneer plaques, the allusion to universal languages that you know, it was something also Madigan really kind of believed in, in terms of Absolutely. architectural languages. Absolutely. I mean, following all of this kind of stuff, all of this initial thinking, you subsequently spent quite a lot of time in the Madigan archive itself, part of which is held in the National Gallery Research Library. So, you know, following all of that, what did you discover in that archival context? Oh, well, it was an absolute treasure trove going <laughs> through the archive. I mean, yeah, just, I mean, some of Madigan's hand-drawn mm. plans and just some of, I mean, it was quite good actually seeing the, almost like the original artwork for some of the illustrations and diagrams that has, you know, then been used in publications and sort of being able to see the original. It was like, oh my God, these are so cool. Yeah. And it became pretty apparent that Madigan was, you know, quite the sort of geometry nerd his belief in that kind of universal language of geometry and a kind of harmony and almost like a sacred geometry. Like mm. he definitely referenced quite a lot of that sort of action. You know, I took all that on board and I particularly took on board yeah, the line drawing. And I was also at the time working on a machine, like a drawing machine. Mm. And so that kind of played into it quite considerably as well. So I was quite, you know, I was looking a lot at line drawing and the mechanics of line drawing and the sort of underlying kind of code or maths of line drawing. When it gets to the sequence that includes the drawing machine, people always describe it as mesmerizing. Yeah. It's a very kind of elegant thing, but um, actually for someone who doesn't know very much about coding, like myself, how do you actually code the machine to draw the drawings? Because in some cases you seem to have inputted Madigan's drawings into your own yeah. well, kind of machine in the work proper? I mean, part of my trying to understand Madigan's geometry was mm. trying to reproduce it. And yeah. so I spent an inordinate amount of time. <laughs> I can show you the spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I love a bit of trigonometry and, you know, any excuse to go there. But it was quite fascinating actually trying to unpack particularly the, the, the trier grid, which is his sort of, um, what is it? It's Calling like a, card. A, it's like a space grid, yeah, mm. for, for the ceilings. And yeah, it's quite tricky. It's like, it's definitely, it's like, wait a second, that's not quite as intuitive as I thought it would be. Mm. And so I spent a lot of time drawing those and trying to get them correct. And so it sort of seemed only right to, you know, run those through the drawing machine. I mean, it's not really what I sort of built the machine to do, but mm. it, it seemed like a good, a good starting point. Um, the trick though really was, the machine is based on a pretty much just CNC machining systems. And, you know, they're very good, they're very accurate, they're very precise, but then they have no regard for time as such. And they certainly don't have any regard for choreography. Mm. And so when you're trying to make a movie, choreography of the objects or the machines as it were is very important you know you want it to draw it in a particular way and that was actually kind of hard it was yeah. like it wasn't like using um, 
editing software or post-production software, which I'm you know, very used to using with timelines and layers and curves. Mm -hmm. It was just straight up ASCII code, which is just text files, you know, long lists of numbers. And then trying to kind of copy and paste them into particular orders mm -hmm. <laughs> so that it would draw it roughly in the, in the, in the time that you wanted. Wow. Yeah, so it was actually kind of fun in that way. It was a bit like, um, you know, it was motion control with a, with a sledgehammer. Mm. Okay. Um, maybe that kind of links to something else I wanted to ask, because I think, well, I, I've kind of gathered that one of the things you were interested mm. in or speculated on was Madigan as a person and as an artist and how he, who is kind of like you, you know, someone who is very expansive in their thinking, you know, how would he kind of respond and adapt the digital technologies that are available to you mm. today? Because as you said, yeah. when he was designing the building, it was, you know, totally, or well, principally analog. It was all sort of hand-drawn designs, watercolors, yeah. correction fluid. There were a couple of, in the archive, there were a couple of computer generated yeah. renderings that were, yeah, I mean, super rudimentary. I mean, they're mm. kind of exciting. And I did sort of play with some of that stuff for a little while, but it didn't make it into the work. It's hard not to imagine that he would have been a pretty early adopter of the generative parametric action that's happening in architecture or has been for a few years now. And just, you know, using the computer to make those kind of offers, you know, mm. plugging in simple rules and then letting it do its thing. You know, I mean, I do that a lot, not, not, not architecturally, obviously, but it's hard not to see him, yeah, mm. being pretty, finding that pretty appealing. As a curator, often working, you know, on an artist or researching them, uh, like historical figures, you kind of feel like you, you come to know them. Did you, did you have a sense of? I mean, a little bit, not, not really. I mean, I yeah. was, you know, it was pretty, it was like speed dating, really. <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> I was sort of charging through it with a, with a pretty sort of visual eye, but, um, yeah, you definitely got a pretty strong sense of how upset he was at the end. Mm, <laughs> and that yeah. was kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. that would be pretty hard to have something that you have poured your heart and soul into and then mm. feel like you're sort of shut out of the process. And yeah, yeah and you, you get quite a strong feeling of that. Yeah. So to give some context to our audience, um, while Cole Madigan built the original National Gallery building, when the building was extended subsequently, he, he didn't receive that commission. And um, as you say, he was kind of really heartbroken. And I guess that also taps into this idea of um, the universal language that he was kind of interested in, the importance of architecture, and in terms of you know the foundational form of the gallery, the equilateral triangle, how it could kind of repeat and extend endlessly, mm. I guess that kind of came to a really abrupt <laughs> conclusion. Well, it came, it, maybe it came to a little bit of a it met a right angle, <laughs> as it somewhere does in the building, and it's like, oh, it's a little bit awkward. It's a little bit off. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like, I can't, you know, I kind of get it. I'm all there for just like the really sort of deep sort of geometric underpinning but then sometimes it's just like you just can't be too dogmatic about that stuff yeah. and it's like oh yeah also I guess like your work really considers Madigan's practice which kind of takes his drawings but also turns them into other things for me you know one of the most compelling kind of sequences in the work is sort of towards the end when you essentially kind of propose an alternate or sort of dynamic architecture I mean Pretty early on in the process, it was something I knew I really wanted to do. Mm. I mean, looking at the building and the sort of perspectival vantage points and just going, yes, this, you know, it would be possible to try and overlay an anamorphically correct alternative onto the building. Whether that was going to be possible, it's like, well, of course it's possible, but, you know, is it actually uh, doable mm. <laughs> by, by me with my limited skill set? So I sort of set out to try and do it. I mean, it was kind of excruciating to do. I had to basically build a model of the building. So there are three vantage points. So that, you know, those are the points, like the actual kind of nodal points from which the perspective makes sense. And 
it was quite funny because I, you know, a few people had sort of said, oh yeah, but if you do that and you're not sitting right on that exact point, it doesn't work and it looks mm. wrong. Yeah. I actually love the wrong. Mm. I really love it. I mean, it's, you know, it's a whole beans ambassadors, you know, when you see the anamorphic skull and you, know, you first kind of realize it's like, what the, okay, I yeah. get it, I get it. It's a little bit like that, but I actually, I quite like the wrong as well. I mean, it's a real payoff when you, when it snaps into, into perfect perspective. But the actual process of doing it, as always, I mean, these things, mm. I, have a, I have quite a history of this, of something, you know, it's just a few notes in your sketchbook, a few lines, but actually sort of pulling it off in the real world is remarkably difficult. Mm. Like, remarkably difficult. Oh, God, it was so hard. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about the 14 year olds in their bedrooms, and it probably wouldn't, you know, they'd be like, oh, it's easy. No <laughs> worries. But, you know, for me, it was quite, it was quite a challenge. And uh, so I was, yeah, I was, it was a very exciting moment to see that happen. And mm. I think one of the things I did coming into this project, having a little bit of experience with outdoor projection mm. and it generally being a pretty uphill battle. You know, most, most of the time you're really just trying to fight to even get something close to what mm. is on the screen, you know, on your screen on the wall. You know, walls generally aren't great projection surfaces, there's ambient light, yada, yada, yada. And so I came into this one really going, okay, I'm going to play to the strengths of outdoor projection. And I think also the, all my kind of brutalist research really helped with that as mm. well. It's like, no, just go hard, you know, yeah. be honest to the materials. And I don't know, subtlety is not rewarded, I think was part of my mantra. Yeah. And that kind of carried over into even into the editing as well. Like, there are no fades in the entire work. It's just hard cuts. Everything's hard, hard, hard. Mm -hmm. Everything slams into itself. I was very happy to see that most of my guesses proved to be right. I was mm -hmm. like, yes, that does work better. Well, yeah, I guess like one of the reasons I really admire this work is because, you know, as you were saying, it's as tough as it is really beautiful. And like for me, um, it kind of operates between these twin interests of Madigan's that are perhaps also interests of yours, you know, of brutalist architecture, which is so emphatic. And then these sort of more ethereal ideas about sacred geometry. And I think the sound, um, which is composed uh, by Byron Scullin, one yep. of your kind of long-term collaborators, like really kind of feeds into that and, and enhances that. Yeah, the sound is so important. I mean, I always talk about sound being the emotional dictator. Yeah. That's what makes you sort of feel about how what you're looking at mm. and I was yeah I was really clear and how I wanted it to be I really wanted it to be brutal yeah. you know I definitely want so the the moments when you have those real kind of structured light patterns are incredibly <laughs> abrasive yeah but they're you know they're awesome they're yeah. so good and then you know you want to contra contrast that and have some moments of yeah beauty mm. some the, the sublime um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, Byron and I have been working together for years. You know, we have a great dialogue. Um, you know, it can all get a little bit last minute, but <laughs> we, you know, <laughs> we've got to, we do have a really good dialogue and yeah, I think, uh, it, yeah, it's great. It's yeah. Really, it's awesome. It shows, um, the sound, I think just like totally brings it together and, and enhances all of the thinking and, and the way it plays out. And I guess, you know, maybe just finally, so much of your work is about time or, or relates to time. Is that focus kind of present in this work, which in many ways feels really different and distinct yeah. from your past practice? No, absolutely. I mean, I think I did take that on a little bit as mm. a, you know, I guess coming back to Madigan's sort of experimental approach. I did mm. kind of approach this commission as kind of an experiment and yeah, it really was sort of to answer some of the questions I had about, you know, large scale outdoor projection mm. and projection mapping and whether those were, whether I had some answers for those. Temporally, I mean, there were a few elements that I was particularly interested on in early on that didn't quite sort of make it into the final cut, but coming back to the beginning really with, with Pioneer, you know, mm. that little spaceship well, both of them are on literally multi-billion year journeys yeah, amazing. <laughs> into space. I think, 
I think the first one reaches the nearest star in something like three and a half billion years. So the chances of that plaque being delivered you know, <laughs> to its first reading could be three and a half billion years away. But I do really love the idea of whoever does encounter it looking back at us mm. and on the plaque it's all about these um, you know there are these sort of radiating lines but they're not actually radiating they're, they're pointing back towards that single point mm. and I've sort of used that a little bit in the work to point to where you need to stand to get that correct perspective moment yeah but I also like there's a, you know, there's a final little, almost like a little Easter egg at the end where you see the sort of pioneer heading off into space and the telemetry coming back. I mean, it, you know, there was a great moment when we got the last signal. Mm. You know, that's it. It's like no more. Yeah. You, don't hear from, you don't hear from them again. And I do, I do kind of love the idea of that, I mean, you know, cosmological time, mm. that super, super deep time. When, when is that going to have it, you know, when will that little pioneer ship have its first encounter? Will they come looking for us? Mm. <laughs> will the National Gallery still be here? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Thank you, Daniel. It's such a complex, loaded, beautiful, tough work. And it's been such a privilege to see it develop. So thank you. And I hope everyone watching can come and see the work, which will be presented at the National Gallery between the 4th and the 14th of March. Thank you. Thank you, Elspeth, for all your help and incredible support as well. <laughs>